Hello, I'm Marilyn Crawford, founder and CEO of Hawa Health, and I'm here today with Dr. Michael Brywe. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for joining our How Are You interview series. We're so excited to learn a little bit more about what you're doing over there at Ortho Live. But before we do, let me introduce you to all of our learners out there. Dr. Um, Brawi is the CEO at Ortho Live and a practicing orthopedic surgeon. He is a motivated, forward-thinking leader with a specific interest in value-based care digital health and justice for the American healthcare consumer. I'm pretty excited to be talking to him today. Relative to orthopedic surgery, Dr. Grywe is a book and author, author, fellowship director, implant designer, educator, and doctor to his many, many patients. Now, OrthoLive is an innovative telemedicine provider dedicated to orthopedic providers. I met up with you several years ago at a conference that was for innovators in the telehealth space. And I was so fascinated by what you were trying to accomplish back then as really a pioneer in that area. So tell us, what led you to create OrthoLive? Well, thanks, Marilyn. I, I, I really appreciate you having me on today. It's great to be here. And, um, you know, OrthoLive became sort of a, uh, it, was, it was a dream at first, sort of trying to help my own patients. And so, you know, I had patients that came from far away uh, to see me, and I felt like they were driving, you know, one, two hours, and I would spend, you know, time going through their MRIs with them, and then they'd have to go back home. And I've like spend only 10 minutes with them. And I felt like, you know, for all that time that they spent in the car, I could do a better job of trying to make it more convenient for them to be able to see me. So um, that was how OrthoLab started. And then I just felt like there were a lot more uses for telemedicine across the country, you know, with athletic teams having injuries all the time, and there was no one to really help those players or injuries that might happen in the workplace. Um, for all those reasons, I formed OrthoLab. And um, we've just seen a really fun ride over the last several years as things have kind of grown. So, And they've probably grown even more dramatically over the last uh, year to 15 months with the pandemic, I would imagine. No question. That was a big shot in the arm for OrthoLive. Um, it just raised the uh, level of awareness for telemedicine across the country and across the world, really. And I think that has you know, spurred a lot of new growth for us which I'm sure it has for you as well, but uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun because of that. Very good. Now, currently, does OrthoLive have more of a national reach or is it um, an international opportunity, perhaps? It's more of a national reach. Um, we uh, haven't done anything internationally yet, but uh, certainly would be willing to do that. But it's kind of, uh, we were first like trying to make sure that we took care of all 50 states, 24-7, mm -hmm. uh, um, 365 care. Wow. And we've, we've been able to accomplish that so far, and, and uh, we're happy. But, um, you know, you never know uh, what opportunities might lie outside of the uh, U.S. You know, boundaries. So I think that's probably your, your next journey that you'll be headed on. Now, tell me, what are the top reasons that patients connect up with orthopedic su surgeons and physicians on OrthoLive? It's really for a musculoskeletal injury. So musculoskeletal injuries for people that aren't familiar are injuries to the bones, joints, muscles, ligaments, tendons in our bodies. And so when those things happen, we typically have pain and disability and loss of function. And uh, we can't do our jobs. We can't play sports very well. Um, it's just hard to sometimes do activities of daily living. So those are our patients, and we've um, we've really accessed them through a number of different channels. But they they'll come to us for um, primarily issues that surround the musculoskeletal system, and maybe they're trying to treat those injuries or they're trying to do prevention there. Uh, that's really how how um, we we get our patients. Now, is it for more pre-patient in-person visits or follow-up care post an in-person visit, or even second opinions, or a little bit of all of that? Well, I guess um, I'd have to, you know, talk about the two different models that we have to kind of get into that. So, um, you know, the, the first model, we actually sell our platform to orthopedic groups so that they can use it with their own patients. Excellent. And so that that was kind of the first model that really worked for OrthoLive. And um, in that model, most surgeons prefer to do follow-up visits using telemedicine. They don't tend to do the first initial visits via telemedicine because it can be a little difficult to kind of get to know the patient. 
But mm -hmm. imaging follow-up is a great way to use telemedicine in those um, brick and mortar practices. So that's usually how that works. On the other side, we have employers that might have anything from a minor injury to a more major injury, and they want to know what to do with that particular injury. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of triage on that aspect of things. And so it's really easy for us to triage an injury when we know what's happened to them. We can see the swelling and the bruising and everything else. So we do actually do a lot of treatment on that side of things, and we'll see those patients right off the bat uh, when they have an injury. And um, we found telemedicine to be a great tool for really helping to direct traffic and direct care. Oh, that's fantastic. The, the triage, uh, I wasn't even thinking about that. Now, how does that work with more of our athletic teams? I know that you were a team physician for a school or university at one point in time. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I'm a team physician at um, high school uh, locally. It's Covington Catholic High School, and I actually was, a, was an athlete when I was younger and, um, you know, played sports in college and um, just, you know, really enjoy that part of things. And for athletes, you know, there's never, you know, sometimes when you get injured, there's, there's mm -hmm. rarely a physician or an athletic trainer on the sideline to help you. Um, unless you're playing football and you're in the middle of a game, it's rare that you might have someone to help you. Sometimes there might be a trainer on the sideline for, you know, some sports, but other sports, you don't have anyone. So using our platform, we're able to put players in touch with physicians and athletic trainers, just like they were right on the sideline. So that's a really nice uh, benefit to what we, we offer as well. That's a huge benefit. I, I know that once, um, you know, some of our marathons and our other more, um, you know, ultra marathons and different athletic uh, triathlons are back into the, the mainstream. Um, right now, a lot of them have kind of gone virtual at your own pace during a time right. frame. But that would be, you know, fantastic. And traditionally, we've got the medical tents with, you know, some massage and some, some light, um, you know, care opportunities. But to have something more advanced like that would be perfect. So I can see that being incorporated quite nicely. Now, tell us, what do your patients and other physicians that are using OrthoLive, what do they say? What type of feedback are they giving you? Well, we actually, we do ask questions, you know, after each of our visits, we say, you know, how did the technology perform? Um, were you satisfied with your visit? And we've had really great, great results on that. Um, we also look at our connectivity because connectivity with uh, telemedicine is so important. And so we have um, over 95% connectivity, which I think is one of the, um, you know, industry leading, you know, rates of connectivity. We, we actually have a uh, customer support team that works on our behalf to understand when somebody's having difficulty, like accessing an app or things like that. And so that's, that has really uh, been, been great. So connectivity is, is key. And then just satisfaction with the virtual visit. We have like 4.92 out of five stars is our current, you know, average running rate. So people are really happy with what you know service they're getting, and um, we just one of our core values is quality, and so I think um, you know uh, quality has been a really big part of of my driving goals and missions, and so that's a that's a big part of what we we try to accomplish on the calls. I know that for your healthcare delivery system, I read, I'm kind of looking at my notes here, that it's all about quality care, efficiency, and functionality. So as you look at those components and what you've accomplished in such a short period of time from, from just your, your initial vision to where you're at today, I mean, it's been dramatic. It's been um, very remarkable and very inspiring. And I hope that other, other types of specialties can can do very similar things um, and learn from your example. Um, I know when we first met, one of my one of my goals was to take telehealth way beyond where it had been at that point in time for more looking at episodic care on let's see what else we can do and push the envelope. And I was more focused on more well-being and, and everybody's looking at all these other ways, all these other use cases. So kudos to you for that. Now, what are the top orthopedic conditions that are the hardest to diagnose? I've always wondered that. Yeah, I think um, the, the ones that are hardest to diagnose via telemedicine are the instability conditions. So um, instability conditions happen when something dislocates or becomes unstable. A lot of times we do hear a common, you know, theme. And so during the pandemic, you know, we would hear a history of, you know, I was running and I kind of cut and then I felt my 
something happened and something didn't quite feel right. And then something popped into place and I feel like I'm better. Well, that's most likely a kneecap dislocation. Mm -hmm. And then the shoulder uh, can be unstable too. So a lot of times the history helps us, but for us to physically demonstrate that it's really hard because we actually have to put our hands on, on the patient. But the main thing I always tell people is, you know, we, we use this as really a triage tool more than anything. And so I know from that history we need to get an MRI and understand what may be torn or injured. Um, and so that, that will confirm the diagnosis when we start to get imaging um, on top of that. So we, we rely pretty heavily on, in, on um, imaging to be able to see what's going on and then basic physical exam maneuvers that we can do. Uh, but I think those instability things are really the, the most challenging um, because you just can't feel it, but you know something may have happened here. And so you have to say sort of possible instability event or something along those lines in your note. <laughs> sure. And you you not only are working with adults, but also pediatrics, I understand. Is that um, you know something across the full span of other um, orthopedic surgeons on OrthoLive? It, it depends on the type of provider. So we have a lot of different experts that um, are on the OrthoLive platform. We have, you know, um, knee and hip specialists. We have sports medicine specialists. We have pediatric specialists. You name it, we kind of have the, um, you know, experts in a particular area. And so um, I personally see a lot of pediatrics in my practice. So a pediatrics kind of comes naturally to me. And I spent a lot of time at Cincinnati Children's Hospital when I was training. So I feel really comfortable with pediatric injuries. And so that, you know, is something we can, we can treat. And it depends on the type of physician and, and what they're used to and what they like to do. But, but yeah, pediatric injuries are, are also part of the spectrum of orthopedic problems that we can handle. Mm-hmm. And I understand that you specialize in shoulder, elbow, knee, and traumatic injury to extremities. So what are the top priorities in gaining care post-traumatic injury? So... I just had my injury. What is the next thing that I should do as that patient? What's the first things that I should be thinking about and taking care of? I think the main thing when you have an injury is a make sure that you don't need to go to like a higher level of care. You know, so um, what are the things that that worry me as a provider if um, you know I see an injury? Well, um, typically deformity uh, is a big, big thing where we want to go not do a telemedicine appointment, probably go to the emergency department or an urgent care, particularly like an orthopedic urgent care would be a good place to go when you have something like that's deformed. Because if there's deformity, that means you may need to have it manipulated and put back into better position and alignment. So that's kind of number one. After that, if you don't see a lot of deformity, then things probably aren't quite as urgent, um, which is, which is great. Uh, you know, uh, if, if you can bear weight on the extremity, <clears throat> that's another good sign mm-hmm. that, um, you, you have more time to be able to, you know, plan your next move when it comes to like going to either get x-rays or visit, you know, provider or see someone via telemedicine. So bearing weight is the, the second thing I would say. And then we look for the subtle signs like swelling, redness, warmth, inflammation. Uh, and again, when you find those things, that's not um, a horrible thing. It's just, yeah, you, you injured that area. Now you probably want to seek some attention for that. And that, that can be done either brick and mortar, telemedicine, or, um, or otherwise. But a lot of times it's not necessary to run off to the emergency department. Um, when you have an ankle sprain, you just know, okay, I'm going to get some swelling here, but I can bear weight on the, the leg and that's good. So now I just need to start maybe putting some ice on it and and resting it and elevating it and doing the good things that we we know about injuries. That's excellent. Three very key things that um, something very important for us all to know, because you never know when you're going to have that type of a traumatic um, event and what to do. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. I have another question that um, someone else was asking me, and it's how can a patient and a patient's family determine if surgery is the best solution for more chronic orthopedic conditions versus doing something over time like physical therapy or other pharmaceutical solutions? Um, what, What suggestions do you have for people that are suffering more chronic conditions like that? That's a great question. I, I love to answer this question because I think it's, um, it's really important for people to, um, to remember like the, the, the way that surgery should you know, fall into the you know, spectrum of care. So for a chronic problem, 
the most important thing for people to remember is that surgery should always be the last resort, you know, and, and the, when, when people, um, you know, you can try a number of different things and if nothing is working and you're having terrible pain and you can't do the things you like to do, then surgery becomes an option. And that's really when we should fall back on surgery for the chronic issues. Acute issues are a little bit different and you differentiate that, which I think is great super smart. So what, what, what I tell people on the chronic side is that we really try to do everything else that we can do outside of surgery first. And then when all else fails, that's when surgery can some, can then become more of a, you know, a go-to solution. But, but um, it also makes the patient a lot happier with their decision for surgery when they've gone through everything else first, and then they know, okay, this is what I have left to, to work through. So I really value that 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 response, and I think that um, that resonates with a lot of um, you know the fear that we have that people are going to automatically jump to surgery. So thank you so much. It's a very respectful approach, and and one that I think. Um, you know, makes so much sense, especially as we're looking at um, cost containment and and just really looking at opportunities, you know, to work with our physicians and have these discussions. My last question for you today is if you are someone that is struggling with an orthopedic issue, how do you select an orthopedic physician and what are the most important things to share with the physician that you select at your first visit? Well, that's a really good question. Um, so I think, <clears throat> how do you select the physician was kind of the first question. I think you always want, um, as a patient, particularly if you've, you've done a lot of the, your um, non-surgical work and you've been trying to get through it and it's just not working and you're looking at an orthopedic doctor, you want to find somebody that's really specialized in whatever condition that you're suffering from. So um, for me, I really specialize in shoulders and elbows. So I rarely see anybody with knee problems anymore. I used to a long time ago, but now I've kind of graduated into more just sub-specialization. But people like that, and they know me and around my community for being the shoulder you know, specialist. And so um, that, I think, goes a long way to, into making people feel more comfortable. And you know what you want to get across to your doctor, I think, in that visit is really um, a few things. Number one, you know, how active are you? Um, you know, you may be 80 years old, but if you're, you know, doing triathlons, you're a different person than the 80 year old that's, you know, um, doing gardening and things like that, which is, you know, great too, but, but you're, you're a little different, you know, person in, in the surgeon's eyes and they want to make sure that you can continue to be the triathlete or, or whatever. So I think your activities is really important. And also the level of pain and functional disability that you have. So we're always kind of keen on understanding like how much pain are you having and is it debilitating pain? And also does the level of function that you have, is it, um, you know, something where we think we can help you to get better from that if we're going to do some type of procedure or are the modalities that we're using, are they making your function and your pain better? And that's a good way for us to judge, you know, how well you're going to do. So I think, um, your activity level, your function, and your pain are really kind of the, the three things you want to you want to talk about. But we also, we love to find out more about the patient. And, you know, anything that you love to do, hobbies, interests, things like that, uh, that's what I love. And I think it's important to be able to, like, convey that, too, because it just makes you more human to the, uh, to the provider. So that's good. Excellent. That's excellent. So my husband um, is currently, um, he's completed oh, probably... I, I'm going to guess 20 or so marathons and a variety of other types of races over the years. Um, and so, you know, he's got, you know, a little bit of aches and pains in the shoulders. And it seems like, you know, that's one of those things that's slowing him down from being able to be as active as he once was. So I may have to send him to you since now I know you've got that shoulder expertise yeah. um, to check him out because we want to get him running again. And so sometimes it might be, well, what's your goals for the future? You know, we know what you've done for the past. We know what your limitations are. You're sharing what your limitations are for right now. But what's your goals for the next five years or even 10 years out? I think that can also Absolutely. help us 
to move in that right direction to meet the goals and the, and the objectives, um, you know, from a, a medical perspective to get that person to where we want them to go. Well, I want to really thank you today for your time to educate our learners on orthopedic care. We enjoy, enjoyed um, learning about OrthoLive and appreciate your advice today for patients seeking out orthopedic care. Um, I do love your motto to provide quality care that is efficient and functional. Um, it's admired and a game changer in healthcare delivery systems today. So congratulations on everything that you've accomplished over the last few years. We're, we're excited to continue to watch your journey. And I suggest that everybody check out OrthoLive. Thank you very much. And we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, Marilyn. I appreciate you having me. You're welcome.